Hello everyone, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and now we are going to the Experiment Design for Computer Science Lecture, Class 4, Part 2, and we are going to talk about pair testing. Uh, there is an example that I like to illustrate pair testing, and it's this. Imagine that you are trying to sell um, a new pair of shoes for a team of, uh, a new pair of shoes for playing soccer, okay? So the idea is that you want to test your new pair of shoes that think that it, um, let us say, it gets used much, it takes much more time to get used, to, 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 low, to, to, uh, to get old. So you buy a team that there is a local school, so you, you, you produce your new pair of shoes for the local school team. Of course, you want to compare the new pair of shoes with the old one. So in one day, you, get, you have the team plays two games on two different weeks. On the first week, you give all the kids the pair of shoes. And on the second week, you give all the kids the old pair of shoes and you see how much the shoes get used. And the ones that get used less, uh, it means that the, sh the shoes is more resilient, right? So what's the problem of this? The problem is what's your experience? So you want to know how much of the soul remains after the game. So you measure the soul before the game and you measure the soul after the game. So you have a difference. And you could get the average, uh, the average of this difference for all the kids. The problem of the average is that the average is kind of sensitive for changes that are very high. And if you think about soccer, and I hope you know a little bit of soccer to follow this, uh, this but in soccer, we have different types of players, right? We have the goalkeeper, and the goalkeeper will stay the entire game near the goal. So we can expect that for the goalkeeper, the, so the, the sole of the shoes will, be, will not change. They will almost not use anything. So even for the new shoes or for the old shoes, the goalkeeper will not use a lot. We also have this kid that runs a lot, runs the entire game. And we expect that this kid will use this, this, the, the sole a lot, okay? So the sole of the shoes, they start, they, they will wear out much faster, okay? So what's going on this is that if you take the average of the goalkeeper and the, average, and the, the kid that runs a lot, this will kind of, this difference will be bigger than the difference of, using the new shoe or the old shoe. So instead of testing whether the new shoe or the old shoe wears out faster, you end up testing whether the goalkeeper or the kid that runs a lot wears out faster. So what's going on here is that there is an external factor that affects your testing. Your testing is affected not only by the quality of the shoe, but by how much the kids run. So the idea is that you want to pair the values of the, wear, the wearage of the shoe to the activities to the kids. So you want to pair together the values of the, the goalkeeper and you want to pair together the values of the, the kid that runs a lot. And this will give you more information, okay? Well, let's see a computer science example, okay? So this happens a lot in when you're testing algorithms on different data sets. So let's say that you're testing a, a search, a meta heuristic search algorithm. Uh, it's an optimization algorithm and you have different problems of uh, optimization. There are many different problems of optimization, right? And this researcher, this researcher, uh, she's only interested in developing an algorithm that is best for one family. So there is one kind, so she develops a new algorithm that is very good for family of problems A. Okay, and she wants to compare her algorithm, algorithm A, against a standard algorithm B that is the, st the state of the art. So her proposal is that A is better than B for this family of problems. For other problems, she doesn't know, but for this specific family of problems, A is better than B. Okay, so she's interested in testing the average performance. So she gets a benchmark of several uh, optimization problems in several different families. And she takes 
the problems that are only in the family A. Okay, so she will compare uh, algorithm A and algorithm B, B in different problems of the same family. Now, because these are different problems from the same family, they probably have similar characteristics, but still we can expect that some of the problems in this family will be easier and some of the problem instances will be harder. Okay, for instance, let's say that this is an optimization to find a path in a graph, a planar graph. So the family is finding optimizations in planar graph. Maybe some graphs are bigger and some graphs are smaller. They have the same characteristics, they just have different number of nodes. So the bigger graphs will be harder and the performance will be worse, even though they are the same family. So if you compare A and B on a very big graph, it will be very slow. But if you compare A and B on a very small graph, it will be very fast, okay? But the, besides the difference in the problems in the instance, the researcher guarantees that the, the measurements are made under the same condition. So it's the same computer for both methods, the same system for both methods, same load for both methods, etc. Okay. Also, the time is measured in a way that is not sensitive of all the projects. One way that you can do this, let's say that you have uh, you are going to run algorithm A 300 times and algorithm B 300 times. One way to guarantee that the background process will not affect is instead of running A, 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 and then running B, 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 you can randomize that. So when you get your script that run the script, that, that run the algorithms, you mix it. So you run A, B, B, A, A, B, 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 A, B, B, A, 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 B, B, B. So if you mix both of them together, it will be less likely that only one process will be affected by other things running in the system, okay? Now, because we have, you know that it's a standard, because of the errors, you know that you want to run um, the algorithm many times. So let's say that you have seven problems. So for each problem, you run the algorithm 10 times. So for algorithm A, you have 70 runs seven instances, 10 times each. For algorithm B, you also have 70 runs, seven instance, 10 times each. Now the question is, what is the variable? Okay, so what, what are you going to do your analysis? What is your sample? Now, this is not a trivial question. And there, this is something that people that are studying algorithms, they usually do it wrong. What we have to ask here is, what is our population? Okay, in the first lecture, we thought, for instance, the population can be all the possible results that an algorithm runs. However, here, we are doing an experiment that is a little bit more complicated, right? We have several problem instances, and for each problem instances, we have several repetitions. Is our population all the runs in any instance? Okay. Are all the, 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 to answer this question, we have to think of what are the independent observations? Which observations are independent? For instance, let's say that we run 10 times in instance one and 10 times in instance two. Are these observations independent? Well, if we think about it, they are not because the, the, the 10 times that the 10 observations that we run in uh, in problem instance one will be different from the 10 observations that we run in, in instance two. Remember, if we run with a very big graph, it will be very slow. If we run with a very small graph, it will be very fast. So the observations here, they are different from the observations here. So the observations, they are not independent. So where can we remember that one of the requirements that we have for this test is that the variables are IID, independent, and from the same distribution. So what is independent here? So the observations, if we only look at one instance, if you only look at one instance, the observations in that distance are independent. But if we look at multiple instances, the observations are, in that are dependent on the instances. So how do we make this independent? One way to make it independent is to look at only one instance. What is the problem of that? If you only look at one instance, 
we are saying that this algorithm is better in that instance and not in the class of problems. So let me draw this here, just so you know. So imagine that we have here, um, okay, here we are. So we have here, all the optimization problems and inside the optimization problems we have families so we have family one two three four inside each family we have instances okay we have instances And inside each instance, we have observations, execution. So each of these points is one time that we execute the algorithm. So we have to think about what is, your, what is our question. If our question is we want an algorithm that can run in any optimization problem, we are thinking about this big group. If our question is we want to run, we want an algorithm that is best for one family, we are thinking about this group. And if our question is we want an algorithm that is good in one specific instance, in one type, in one graph, then we are thinking about this group. Now, in the previous slide, we mentioned that the goal of this researcher is that she wants to develop an algorithm that is good for a given family. So she is running her experiment in this family level. Okay, so for this case, we are not interested in the individual observations. What we are really, we are not interested in the individual executions. What we are really interested in is the average performance of the algorithm in each instance. So for each instance, so what we're gonna have is that for each instance, we're gonna have several executions. But our real observation will be the mean value for each instance. So this is our observation, the mean value for each instance. Okay? Why, so what happens if we don't do this? If we don't uh, separate, if we don't do this difference correctly, what I often see in papers in, optimiz in optimization is that the researcher will execute many uh, observations in many instances, and we we'll put we we'll do a statistical analysis on all the observations, but we'll try to do uh, the apply the conclusions to the family. But the problem with that is that we by by including all the observations we are going to reduce the error too much we're going to have a lot of replication like we're going to have it's like we had the same sample many times to give an idea it's like if we're measuring the height of a student of the students in a university but we get the same uni student and we measure the height of that student many times that student will be overrepresented in the sample so here what we are interested in is the average performance in each instance and we want to see this average across all of the across all the family okay all right so however going back to the pairing the variability of the results due to the different test problems is a source of variation so big graphs there will be a lateness and smaller graphs will be uh, not so much lateness, but we are interested not in this variance, but we're interested for like for for the small graph is algorithm A or going to be faster, 
For the big graph, is algorithm A or algorithm B faster? For the giant graph, is algorithm A or algorithm B faster? So what to solve this problem, to solve this difference, to remove the influence of these big graphs, we want to pair the, the we want to pair the observations. Okay? So how do we do this? The idea is that for each observation we create a pair, A and B, for each problem. So for each problem we have a pair, one observation from uh, algorithm A, one observation from algorithm B. The hypothesis testing is doing is done on the sample of problem differences. So it's not in the previous case in the previous video we saw the difference of means, but here we are looking at the difference of problems. So let's look at the statistical uh, model. So the statistical model is similar to the last one, but there are some key differences here. Okay. So let's say that yaj and ybj are the paired observations for the problem j, okay? So the pair difference will be bj, distance j, which is yaj minus ybj. Now, the model for yij is grand mean, so this is the mean, uh, this is the mean of the algorithm, and this is the influence of the problem on the mean. So tau i is the influence of problem, sorry, tau i, tau i is the influence of the algorithm on the mean. So this is the grand mean of everything. And this is the influence of the algorithm. So the grand mean plus the influence of the algorithm will be mu i, okay? So this is the mean of the algorithm. Now beta j is the influence of the problem. And this is what we want to eliminate. Remember that in the previous model, we only had mu i, and we had epsilon. Now we have this beta here that we want to eliminate. So how can we eliminate this? Well, if we think that the difference dj is yij minus ybj, we can re replace yij with this. So yij is mu plus tau a, which is the influence of the algorithm, plus bj, which is the difference for the problem, plus epsilon aj. And we subtract from the difference of the, uh, of the algorithm. So it's minus mu, tau b, bj plus eb. Now, we see here that the influence of the problem is the same. So here we are assuming that the problem influences both of the algorithms equally, okay? So if we move the equal parts together, we have mu, plus bj minus mu plus minus bj. So it, all this becomes zero, okay? So our statistical model means becomes the mean of the difference plus epsilon j. So by replacing, by uh, subtracting the means of each problem, remember that in the previous one, we took the mean of everyone and we subtract that. Here, we subtract the means of each problem. And by subtracting the means of each problem, we remove the effect of the problem in the analysis. Okay, now, the new hypo now that we have our statistical model, we can do our new hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. The new hypothesis is mu d, okay? So equal to zero. So the difference of the two methods, the difference of the two methods is zero. And the alternate hypothesis is mu g is different than zero, okay? And this will be a, t a test of hypothesis on a single sample, the sample of difference. Now, so now our population is the difference in averages until convergence for the problems under investigation. Now, because this is a one test hypothesis on one sample, we have our test statistic is what we already know is T0, which is the average of the differences divided by the error of the, the, the sample, but divided by the uh, square root of the sample size. And like in the first lecture, this is distributed on a student variable with n minus one degrees of freedom. And here, our sample size is the number of problems, not the prob number of executions, the number of problems. Okay, some things that should be to, to notice again, in this, import, in this example, it's very important to determine the minimal interesting size as 
the average time gains. So for instance, we cannot say just five, five seconds because maybe for the small problem, five seconds is a huge difference. And for the big problem, five seconds is a very small difference. So our interesting effect size here must be something relative. For instance, we want to gain on average, I don't know, 2%. So our algorithm needs to be 2% better than the old algorithm for this effect to be actually interesting. Okay. Uh, so as we said before, the most important sample size here is the number of problem instances. So it doesn't really matter how many times you uh, execute each problem instance. You just need to be small, big enough to trigger the CLT so that we know that our estimate for the problem, for the performance in one problem is uh, representative. But if the number of repetitions is big enough, like maybe a 10 or maybe seven or something like that, then uh, we have good values and we can test a, a big number of samples, okay? So of course, like I said, the number of repetitions has an impact or related to the observation, the uncertainty related to each observation. And this will influence our residual, but the number of, this, the, the number of uh, uh, problems is more important here. So a few more things that we have to consider when we do a pair testing. Uh, so when we do this pairing, what we're doing is that we're removing the effects of controllable noise edge factors. So here we are pairing on the problems. If we go back to the soccer example, we can pair on the kids so that we remove the influence of the different kids on the waste of the, the, on the, waste of the, the soccer. Another difference, let's say that we are going to test gasoline. We produce a new gasoline and we want to say, so see if it's better for cars. Of course, the efficiency of the gasoline depends a lot on the car because some cars are more efficient, some cars are less efficient. So we want to make a pairing on the car to remove the effect of the differences of the car in your testing, okay? So the pairing is important when we have a strong correlation between the samples, which is also, uh, we can also say that it's our heterogeneous experimental conditions, different cars, different kids, different problem instances, etc. So let's plug some numbers. So we're going to use this test data and these test data, they are available on the GitHub. So you can check the GitHub to try if you want to use this test data for your, for your study. So here we have three columns. Column one is the problem. So this is problem instance one. Problem two is the algorithm and problem three is the convergence time. So we have problem one, uh, algorithm A, problem one, algorithm A, and you can see that there is a variation here. Sometimes it runs in 30 seconds. Sometimes it runs in 48 seconds, sometimes in 20 seconds, okay? And then we have problem one for algorithm B, and then we have problem two for algorithm A, problem two for algorithm B, problem three for algorithm A, and you can see now it takes 100 seconds, so it's a much more difficult problem. If we go to problem seven, we can see that problem six is already 300 seconds. Problem seven is like 400 seconds. So it takes a lot of time here, okay? So it's very different. Problem A is runs in 30 seconds. Problem seven runs in 300 seconds. So it's a big difference. Anyway, our sample size, our sample size of problems is seven, okay? We are interested to see differences in mean time greater than 10 seconds. It probably would be better here to use a percentage, okay? With a power of at least 0 0.8, with a significance level of 0 0.05. So the researcher performs 30 repeated runs of each algorithm from random initial conditions. So because the algorithm is, has influence from random factors, uh, it, he, the researcher repeats the, per, the, per, the, the analysis 30 times with different random seeds. On C, we, uh, on, on R, we can see how we do this. So here we read this data file here, benchmark CSV. And now because we have every single execution, 
we want to summarize, okay? So we're going to use the aggregate function in R. An aggregate function will say that time, the time is explained by the problem and the algorithm. So it will create a pair problem algorithm. So we're going to have A1, A2, A3, A4. And we summarize that by taking the mean. So we are estimating the, con the, the convergence value for each problem algorithm pair based on the mean of the observations. And when we do that, we have a new data, AG data, which has two values for each problem, A and B. So it has two values for problem one, two values for problem two, two values for problem three. And it has seven values for each problem. So we have seven values for algorithm A, seven problems, and seven values for algorithm B, seven problems. Now, now that we have this, actually the analysis is the same as before. The pairing is not on the test, the pairing is on the experiment design. So pairing here is how we pre-process the data to remove the noise. So now that we have aggregated the data, we do the t-test exactly the same way that we did on the previous video, okay? So we do a t-test of time explained by algorithm, uh, paired, true, so it's pairing on the order, uh, and the data is ag data, okay? So it's a paired t-test, it's time by algorithm, and our t is uh, minus nine, uh, so our, our, um, our statistic is minus nine, which gives us a p-value of 0 0.5. So because our uh, alpha was 0 0.05, we can reject the new hypothesis here. And we can see that the confidence interval of the mean of the differences is between minus 10 and minus 20 seconds. So we have, we have definitely more than 10 seconds of difference between the two algorithms, okay? Now, uh, just to see our experiment design, we can, instead of using aggregate, okay, we can simply use the difference of the times. So we have an, an array that is difference of times, aggregate time one to seven, aggregate time. So we can do, it's the same thing, we do the difference. So we don't need to do a pair t-test on the t-test, we can simply make the difference of the means and do a t-test on, uh, on a single sample that is the sample of differences. And you can see that the result is exactly the same. So why is the paired test on two samples equivalent to one sample test on the difference vector of the samples? Think a little bit about that. If you can answer this question, then you understood what is the mathematical model for the paired t-test. Now, of course, uh, after we do the test, we have to verify our assumptions. And our assumptions is normality, variances, and independence. So we do the, here the Shapiro test for to see the normality. And we can see that it's mostly normal, except that the last problem has a much higher uh, value than the others, which is kind of acceptable. It's a minor, um, it's a minor variation. We can see that the p-value here, it rejects the new hypothesis that is normal, but when we remove this outlier, we can see that it's well within the, the confidence interval, uh, the p-value, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, if we repeat the test, with the, if we repeat it, so this outlier is outside of normal. So we think, oh, maybe this outlier is making the data not normal. So let's repeat the test without the outlier. Even if we remove that outlier, our test still rejects the new hypothesis. And if anything else, we got an even bigger difference. So our outlier does not influence our results, okay? So this is something, if you see a big outlier, you might want to repeat your test without the outlier, just to make sure that your results do not change. So you can see that um, even if you have a problem with your testing, uh, with your assumptions, you can test, see if the assumptions invalidate your results or not.
Now, why do we pair? What happened if we did not pair? What happened if we did this test, but without doing the pairing, okay? So here we have the test on the basic data without pairing, okay? Just a t-test of time versus algorithm. So this is a chute sample t-test. And we see here that our, um, our statistic is minus 0 0.3. Now our p-value is 0 0.7. So here we do, cannot at all reject the new hypothesis. So without pairing, our test does not reject the new hypothesis. And you can see that our mean difference is much larger. Our confidence interval for the difference of the, of the difference of the algorithms is minus 100 seconds to plus 80 seconds. This is a huge confidence interval, okay? So what is happening here? Well, this image kind of explains. So if you look at the right image, these are the values for algorithm A for each of the problems. And these are the values for algorithm B for each of the problems. So these are the values for algorithm A for each of the problems. And these are the values for algorithm B for each of the problems. And if you look at this, like the difference between the problems is huge. If you just take a test to compare these two samples, of course, the test will say that these two samples are the same because these two samples, they, they cover a whole, a huge amount of, of space. But when we pair them, when we look at problem by problem, we can see that problem by problem, a is always better than B. We can see that this difference is consistent. So the difference between problems is consistent. Although the difference in the sample without considering the problems is not consistent. So when, the, when there's a huge difference between the problems, we should do pairing. Okay, so what we're doing here is that we're using information about our problem to guide our analysis. Now, there's one thing very important, okay? When you have a relationship between the problems, you should do pairing. However, when you do not have a relationship between problems, you should not do pairing, just as if you do pairing when you need to do, you can detect if you should reject the new hypothesis or not. And if you do not do pairing, you, the, the test become much weaker. If you wrongly do pairing on an experiment where you should not do pairing, then you're gonna have an artificially high uh, p-value, okay? Because when you, when you do a paired test, the, the statistic will pair this, the observations. And if there is no relationship between the observations, the pairing will find uh, information that it does not really exist. So you're gonna get a fake result. So when the observations are highly, correlate, are highly related, when there is a high difference between one observation and the next, Pairing is very important. But when the observations are not highly related, you should not do pairing, okay? Very important, this point. All right. So this leads us, I think this is the end. Yeah, this is the end of uh, the explanation of pairing, uh, pairing statistics. So in the last class, in, this in the last class, we described the new hypothesis testing to do statistical inferences for a single sample. In this class, we generalize this procedure to a common situation where we have two samples. In two samples hypothesis testing, we do the inference based on the difference between the sample estimators. And when there's a high correlation between observations of each sample, it's important to perform the pairing of the observations, okay? Now, uh, one very important point, let's talk about report number two, okay? Report number two is due three weeks from now. So report number two is very similar to report number one. So in report number two, you must choose an experiment, perform and analyze the results. 
Like in the report number two, your report should have four, four parts. Introduction, where you explain the experiment and the scientific question that you're trying to answer. Experiment design, where you plan the data collection and the analysis that you're gonna do. Data collection, that you report on the data and the results. And the analysis, and the analysis must be a conclusion based on the hypothesis that you created and the value of the statistics and if you can reject the new hypothesis or not, okay? So important that the difference between report number two and report number one is that in report number two, you must use statistical inference to analyze the results, okay? So in the experiment design, you need to describe the hypothesis used. What is the new hypothesis? What is the alternate hypothesis? What is the variable of interest? What is the statistical model that you are using, okay? In the analysis section, you must remember to do to test the, to check the assumption. So you must check if your you must check if your data is is uh, your sample follows normality. You if you are testing on unknown variance or known variance, you need to test your variance. If you're testing on pair, you must show where the pairing happens, and you must show how you guaranteed independence on your experiment. So basically the difference between report number two and report number one is that you need to do hypothesis testing on, on report number two, okay? And please do not forget to do reproducible science. So include what function to use to do the hypothesis testing, include what functions you use to do data processing. So include the code together with your uh, report. Now, one question that is very natural is, okay, because this report is very similar from report one, can I just get the data from report one and do a hypothesis test? And the answer is no, okay? And there's a very good reason for that. The idea of when you do experimental design is that the setup of the experiment must be done following the idea of what you're going to produce later. So for instance, before you do the experiment, you need to choose the variable, you need to choose the statistic, you need to choose alpha, you need to choose beta, you need to choose your hypothesis, okay? So by choosing all of these, you can do the data collection and you can select the experiment. If you collect the data and after that you do the hypothesis, it's very easy to select alpha, beta, the statistics, everything to do exactly the result that you want. That's called harking. Hypothesis, hypothesizing after the results are known. And that's a very easy way to, do, to add bias. So if you change your hypothesis after you get the results, you can just choose the hypothesis that gives you exactly the result that you want. So you need to define your hypothesis before you collect the data, okay? However, this does not mean that your data from experiment one is useless. Of course, you can use the data from experiment one. Just like in machine learning, where you have training data and test data, you can think of your data experiment one as a uh, initial experiment. So using the, for instance, using the data for experiment one, you can estimate the value of the variance, and then you can do a, a hypothesis test based on known variance. That's stronger than if you did a hypothesis test based on unknown variance. Also, you can use the, uh, the values from experiment one to decide what should be your new hypothesis and your alternate hypothesis. But you need new values. You need new, new experiments to actually test the, those hypotheses. You can also use uh, experiment one to estimate how many uh, samples do you need. Now, we have not discussed yet sample calculation. That will be for experiment three, but you, you can use this information, okay? All right, so this is the end of the lecture, and if you have any questions, ask, you can ask on the forum in Manaba, you can ask on the comments, or you can send me an email. See you uh, next week, and next week we're going to talk about what we do when the data is not neural. All right, bye-bye.